Welcome to Layer Zero. Layer Zero is a podcast of unscripted conversations with the people that make up the Bitcoin community. Crypto is built by code, but it's composed by people, and each individual member of the crypto community has their own story to tell. The cypherpunks understood that the code they write impacts the people that use it, and Layer Zero focuses on the people behind the code because Bitcoin is people all the way down, and always has been, which might be an offensive statement to many of the Bitcoiners. And the reason why we're talking about Bitcoin today is because I have on my old co-host, CK Snarks of POV Crypto. So longtime Bankless listeners will probably have known about POV Crypto, but it was actually the podcast that I started with CK, with the guest here, before starting the Bankless podcast. Uh, it was the, the precursor podcast. And POV Crypto, Point of View Crypto, was me, the Ethereum, and CK, the Bitcoiner. And we also happened to be college friends. So we were friends before we discovered Bitcoin and Ethereum, respectively. Uh, and that allowed POV Crypto to be a different kind of podcast. In, it got started in 2018, 2019, and it was like a bear market darling of a podcast. People loved it at the time. And it was really because it was something different where two differing perspectives were able to come to the same place and sometimes like aggressively yell at each other, yet still hug it out at the end of the show every single time. And so it was a nice relief where it was a very important conversations about like the philosophical differences between Bitcoin and Ethereum from two people that very much believed on each in each other's respective camps. Uh, and so the fact that uh, CK and I were college friends, I went to his wedding uh, and, and we have, you know, we're friends. Uh, and so we can yell at each other yet actually not and then still be respectful. And you can actually move the needle with conversations. And so it, it hosted a lot of very important conversations, I'd say, in 2018 to 2020. Um, since once, once the bull market started, CK, who uh, is operations at BTC Media, uh, Bitcoin Magazine, uh, the, the Bitcoin Conference, uh, all that stuff. Uh, and so once the bull market started, I doubled down on Bankless, he doubled down on BTC Media. Um, but we've always kept in touch, of course, uh, as our respective ecosystems has built out. It's been a year since we have recorded. Uh, and so this is uh, the reunion of POV Crypto. So for the long time POV Crypto fans, sorry for going over a year without recording an episode. I hope you enjoy this one though, uh, because we have a lot to catch up on. So without further ado, we'll get into the conversation with CK Snarks right after we talk to some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. Arbitrum One is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum One, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum One and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. If you've been listening to Bankless, you know that we're fans of the modular blockchain thesis. The idea that blockchains will separate execution from data availability and consensus, allowing all three to become the best versions of themselves. And Fuel has built the fastest modular execution layer in the industry. By supporting parallel transaction execution, Fuel unlocks significantly faster throughput for the Web3 world. Fuel also goes beyond the limitations of the EVM with its own Fuel VM which is more efficient and optimized, opening up the design space for developers. And lastly, Fuel brings a powerful developer experience with its own domain-specific language, Sway, and a supportive tool chain called Fork. With Fuel, you can have the benefits of smart contract languages like Solidity while adopting the improvements made by the Rust tooling ecosystem, letting the Fuel development environment go beyond the limitations of the EVM. If you want to learn more, there's a link in the show notes to see how you can get involved with the Fuel network. Nexo is your financial hub for all your crypto needs. Nexo lets you buy crypto instantly with your credit or debit card or via bank transfer. They also have an awesome advanced trading platform called Nexo Pro that pays you rewards when you swap crypto assets. And Nexo also lets you earn interest on your crypto in Bitcoin, ETH, or other assets. And they also give you an instant crypto line of credit with as low as 0% APR. And they also give you access to a crypto backed MasterCard of course, earning you more crypto when you use it. So enhance your financial life with Nexo, who ensures all credit lines are over collateralized with insurance on all custodial assets. Nexo, the right place for your crypto. 
So click the link in the show notes to join over 5 million users who are getting the most out of their crypto. What's up, CK? How's it going? Doing good, man. Enjoying your apartment. <laughs> yeah, well, it's great to have you here. Uh, it's been a while. It's yeah, been a long time. Since we recorded, at Since least. we recorded, yeah. Um, for Bankless listeners that don't know, who are you? Uh, I'm the general manager of Bitcoin Magazine, but uh, David and I are old friends from mm-hmm. uh, college days, uh, and uh, we're, we kind of were partners in crime for a while. Uh, we started both of our careers in the Bitcoin and crypto space uh, doing a podcast together called POV Crypto. Yeah, the PV Crypto Pod was like I think it was the uh, there were there were definitely other podcasts that were a big deal like Laura Shin's podcast was a big deal but I think we kind of like dominated the 2018 to 2020 bear market in terms of just like we had we had good listenership but also just like who listened to POV Crypto as I think uh, it, it was an interesting set of people uh, for again for the listeners who don't know you want to describe POV Crypto and how it came to be and what it was. So pretty much David and I kind of started our careers with similar-ish perspectives on the market. Mm -hmm. Uh, David was a lot more into uh, the blockchain ecosystem, really into Ethereum, you're mining Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was already pretty captivated by Bitcoin, uh, and I've since become more captivated by Bitcoin. Uh, And I don't know, we, we... we s- tried and failed to do a podcast one time, and then we yeah. kind of just started. I was, it was like November twenty eighteen. I think we late twenty eighteen. I think we tried and start. I uh, tried to do the first episode like two times, like yeah, we, two or three times, two or three times, and then the, we did it like the fourth time, and we we're like, this still wasn't what we wanted. But at some point, we were like, we just have to ship a goddamn episode. So we just re- yeeted the episode and like got like fifteen listens or something. Like yeah, that. I think it was just our friends, yeah. but pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much the whole point was like I was the Bitcoiner, mm-hmm. David was the Ethereum, and like we were going to talk about the market, what we saw. Uh, you know, we felt like these communities were already very siloed mm-hmm. um, and they were really talking at each other on Twitter a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we were kind of the only forum that I feel like had honest conversation with uh, with both perspectives respectfully over an extended period of time. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. The way I, I describe POV crypto is like during the 2018 to 2020 bear market, there wasn't the communities that you see today. Like there was just Bitcoin and Ethereum. Like there were there were like other like bull market like ecosystems that all went away during the bear market. And like basically all that was left was Bitcoin and Ethereum. Like all the people that like were bullish on public private key cryptography and some sort of crypto system, the only people that were left were like Bitcoin and Ethereum. And these communities couldn't talk to each other because none of them were friends. They were just like too ideologically like separated. And so like that's where we had the privilege of like being college friends. Yet one of us was the Ethereum, one of us was the Bitcoiner. We made POV crypto because we were the only two people that could come together and like argue with honest arguments. And so we had like these hour long, we had called them like fight nights, uh, we also did interviews. But basically we were the place where like the Bitcoin perspective and the Ethereum perspective met. Yeah, no, totally. And uh, we had awesome guests on and it was a very unique setting because like David would bring in the the cream of the Ethereum space Mm -hmm. and I would just drill them with all the questions (laughs) that like Bitcoiners would want to ask them. And then vice versa, I would bring on like someone who's pushing forward Bitcoin in a big way, a developer, uh, you know, an entrepreneur in the space. And, you know, David, like, well, why not this? Why this won't work? Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff. Uh, And I thought, you know, one, it was fun, but uh, I thought, you know, we really added something unique to the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, okay, so there there was like the Bitcoin episodes, the Bitcoin podcasts. And then, then there were, there was the Ethereum podcasts. There may, maybe there was actually only two of us, two of them. There was ours and then also into the Ether. But like the difference was that when we would do an Ethereum interview, we would bring on an Ethereum guest. We would also have a Bitcoiner and like vice versa. Yes. Uh, and, and so you would, and, and, and because we, we did so many episodes, we got we, we were into like two, almost episodes, like 200 episodes. Yep. So our listeners got to like kind of know us and know our perspectives and saw kind of like the character development of the actual episode of the, of the conversation. And you would see where like the Ethereum influence would influence you and you would see the Bitcoin influence influence me in our thinking. But we also like never wavered from our positions. Still like, to this day. <laughs> to this to this day. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so it's, it's been like a year or so since we recorded a podcast. Uh, yeah, a little bit less than a year. It's been a minute. A little bit less than a year. Uh, and it's like, it really kind of, things started to pause when 
slow down when uh, the bull market started, like uh, the Bitcoin communities and the Ethereum communities, we were in the same spot during the 2018 to 2020 bear market. Like the Bitcoin communities and the Ethereum communities, very different communities, but they were still together, right? It was like we were still on crypto Twitter interacting with each other, even though we were different communities. And then as soon as like the bull market happened, like the Bitcoiners did their own thing. Like we diverged as communities, I'd say. Would you agree with that take? I mean, I, I was like a little bit more yes and no. I definitely knew that that was very much your perspective, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this time last year. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's fair to say that like <laughs> these communities are still definitely, um, you know, rub rubbing up against each other in a big way. Although like, let's just call it like the Ethereum only ecosystem and then the Bitcoin only ecosystem have definitely both developed a yeah. lot. Um, yeah. you know, back in the day there was just crypto and blockchain conferences. Now there's, you know, very specific gatherings, very specific, um, mm -hmm. meetups, you know, all of these things definitely have defined themselves and become more independent for sure. So I, I, I want to definitely get into, uh, like since it's, since it's been a year and a little bit more since like the POV crypto was really at, at its height. Uh, we want to kind of reflect on like, all right, who, who was right? Because that was the whole point of the episode or, or the podcast was like, one of us was right and one of us was wrong and it could only be one, right? That was kind of the air of the podcast. That was the vibe. That was, I, don't, that was, I don't know how true that is though. Well, so yeah, so let's ask that question because I, I think you and I do agree on like, uh, there's going to be one blockchain to, that's going to be the winner, like that sits in the throne. And there was, an, there was uh, an argument that I remember having on Twitter where I think it was West Coast Waka. Shout out West Coast Waka, who's always been with us ever since the beginning. Uh, where we're, they were like, uh, how, how do you know who's right in the end? And we both agreed like market cap. Market cap is the determining factor. Do you still, do you still align with that? Well, I definitely think that the journey, every metric and every sacred cow is going to like, get challenged you know, across the spectrums um, as more intense and malicious actors, uh, get, you know, with lots of capital come in, you know, I don't know if market cap or any specific metric is like the key metric. I think that the, what, what matters at the end is where is economic activity happening and, and what I think you, why it makes sense that there's going to be one settlement layer for, global economic activity mm -hmm. and we're going to consolidate around whatever works the best for a number of reasons many of which a lot of people know about many of which are unknowable to this point but um because of efficiency mm. so right now there is massive inefficiencies in the the wild and ma massive like in like not connectedness uh like the financial system is very very fragmented and i think what is going to happen is uh, I think governance is going to become way less unified. I definitely believe in the sovereign individual thesis, mm -hmm. but that's going to be enabled by using a lot of shared common tech mm -hmm. similar to, I think it's going to be the Bitcoin blockchain, but let's just call it one global mm -hmm. settlement layer for the world. You know, almost like that. You don't have to trust that person in order right. to settle value with them. Like that's what having one global blockchain does. Right. Okay, so so you do believe in like one uh, the dominance of one ecosystem yeah, in, in the long term. Yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, hum humanity requires yes. it. Yes, yeah. like we th we need this to move forward. Like right now, there's just too much. Uh, it's it's difficult to make economic calculation, mm -hmm. right? So um, I think that this is an economic advancement on the levels of the world converging on gold, or I mean, much, much greater than that, but uh, it's going to bring about an enormous amount of efficiency gain, productivity gains, uh, yeah. and capital allocation improvements if we can, uh, you know, gather around one. And I think that we will because we, we need it. Right. And so, like, 100%, I 100% I agree. There's, like, one, if there's one single standard, if there's one global coordination focal point where we all like, hey, this is what we use to coordinate, that's, that is the point of crypto. And I, th I think one of the reasons why people resonated with POV crypto is because like a lot of the same stuff, we, have, we agreed on a lot of stuff. Like yeah. we have very similar principles. And I think where we disagree is like 
the execution of that, like how that actually manifests. And so like that, that's kind of like why we could come together uh, at POV Crypto is because like so much of our founda foundation about like why this stuff is important is the same thing. But you think it's expressed in Bitcoin and I just think it's expressed in Ethereum. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if we necessarily have the same vision for the future, yeah. but I think part of the show too is you can also look into our base assumptions on mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. uh, our political perspectives and that kind of thing, and then see how that's reflected in, you know, how we look at the the crypto ecosystem. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to get into like too much of like generalizing, but I would definitely say like, even when I was in high school and I didn't even understand politics, like, you know, I would take like a stupid test and be like, yeah, you're a libertarian, you know, <laughs> like that, that was like kind of always part of my character. Mm -hmm. Um and then, you know, obviously, you know, you know, you can describe your own political leanings, but I, I do think that it was interesting to kind of just see how, yes, Bitcoin crypto, that changes your worldview a lot, but it's also really colored by what you already believe is like how the world works. And I think that was definitely something that we explored at, at POV Crypto, uh, where we talked about like people's ideological backgrounds and like how they kind of would naturally find themselves in one ecosystem or the other. Definitely. Um, I started off very, very liberal, and then since getting into crypto, I found myself going just more moderate, definitely more conservative, but not conservative holistically. But yeah, I would say like coming into the crypto world, it, it was an interesting exploration of just like, all right, who are you as a person and what values do you have and how does crypto express those values? And that was the other thing that was interesting uh, on POV was like, all of we had a mix of listeners right we had the bitcoin listeners and we had the ethereum listeners and all the ethereum listeners were like that ck guy just rubs my rubs my <laughs> just rubs me the wrong way man i can't stand that guy and like all the bitcoiners would tell go to you and be yeah, like that david you. guy that guy's an <laughs> idiot man people would be like how can you guys be friends <laughs> <laughs> like, bro, you guys are so sad. Like, come on. You can't disagree with someone. I think maybe that is a reflection of the times. But, yeah. you know, yeah, I mean, how, people, like, mm -hmm. if you can't disagree and then still respect someone, like, do you even know them? Right. Honestly? Well, that's why, that's why I think people, like, really listen to POV Crypto and, like, really appreciated it. Because, like, it was, it was the conversations that a lot of people wanted to have. But no one could do it in a way that wasn't like disrespectful for some for some reason. I mean, even at times I would get disrespectful. Like, yeah, to be but, honest, but so we like, both we both would, but we would also like not let it interfere with the conversation. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, it would cool cool back at the end. Mm -hmm. All right, good show. Talk to you tomorrow, <laughs> right. that kind of thing. Who's gonna edit this one? Blah 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. No, I remember like my wife with you know, then fiance, but now wife, you know, she would always like clown me like, man. You must have had a really heated episode because I could hear you all the way in the kitchen. <laughs> there was a lot of yelling. Yeah, the the names Fight Night episodes were definitely true to their name. Um, all right, so we do. Do we want to like recap uh, the reflect on the year thus far since we haven't done a POV crypto episode in a year? Yeah, man, what a wild bear market. So do well also bull market, right? So yep. did say, so say we we stopped we stopped doing POV stuff in like twenty uh, twenty ish, maybe, maybe so we we were like doing it two to three times a week up mm -hmm. until 2020 all of 2021 it was like two episodes here mm -hmm. two episodes here two episodes here that kind of thing uh and then you know just shy of a year ago yeah. it was like our last episode so did the 20 because there was this air on pov crypto that like the bull market will return we we were childs of the 2017 bull market mm -hmm. pov crypto was a bear market podcast yeah uh, but it was always under the assumption like okay the bull market will w return once again and then it did uh and then like you doubled down on bitcoin media i doubled down on bankless um did if we want to put ourselves back in the shoes of like 2018 to 2020 christian and david uh did the 2021 2022 bull market go how you expected it to go i would say yes and no uh, this is something we were talking about yesterday, like as the Bitcoiner, the mm -hmm. way to have made the most amount of USD or SAS or whatever mm -hmm. would definitely have been to listen to David. <laughs> like there's no question there. Um, but on the flip side, like the bull market pushed forward Bitcoin adoption in an insane way. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we, we now have Bitcoin playing on the, the playing ground of nation states. I mean, and you know, that's opening the door for a lot of crypto to happen as well. Um, and 
we're also, you know, we're seeing uh, Bitcoin mining being integrated into energy infrastructure in a very quick way. Like, I, th I think that real Bitcoin adoption definitely aligned with my perspective of, of the bull market. Um, but if you're just like, you know, trying to make as much USD, trying to make and let's just assume not even trading, just mm -hmm. like you're participating in this right. market, like, I definitely think that there's a very clear answer there. So, sure. you know, and on my, on my end, like Bitcoin's supposed to give you peace of mind. Mm -hmm. So like if you understand the protocol, you understand the system, you understand the end result, like how could you not have peace of mind? So uh, being working in this space where, you know, I'm fully aligned with my ideology and my vision for the future, like that's increased my earning power an enormous amount. Obviously, I own more Bitcoin now than I you know ever thought possible. But at the same time, like. It is what it is, you know, mm -hmm. being on the being on the alpha end of the cancel on effect, as I would describe it, it's definitely <laughs> really fucking lucrative. There's no question about that. Uh, to explain that metaphor, the alpha end of the cancel on effect, you're saying that Ethereum is where issuance occurs. And so if you're on the Ethereum ecosystem, you have the net effects of the cancel on effect. That's better. Yeah, well, so the cancel on effect is this idea that uh, if you're closer to where the money or the assets or the whatever is being issued and you get it first, mm -hmm. then you have a lot to gain. And people who get it last, you know, get let, you know, they gain less mm -hmm. or they're even maybe uh, on the on the short. They get the short end of the stick. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're not creating assets in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it really it's just like there's there's le there's not that much alpha in uh, in being Inert a part of the e yeah. it's like uh, in like like the alpha is not the same as like, hey, I can be an insider <laughs> in Ethereum yeah. And I can understand where the trends are going and I can get tokens that, mm -hmm. you know, will appreciate or whatever, get speculated on. Uh, it's almost like people like people like I want to buy Bitcoin so that way I can get the next airdrop. Right. Like a hundred, a thousand percent of that activity all went to Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Like that would stop being even a thing in Bitcoin. I do. Yeah, I do remember that during 2017, one of the things you were saying in our group chat was like, Bitcoin pays dividends because Bitcoin would keep on getting forked and forked and forked. Yeah, that didn't that did not pay. I that, mean, it did get forked, just the forks stopped being valuable. Yeah, <laughs> like no, it stopped being relevant. Yeah, uh, which is good for Bitcoin. And what do you mean? Oh, because the Bitcoin meme is more dominant. Yeah, it just showed like, hey, you can't just fork this thing. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Not successfully. But then I would say, okay, so yes, a lot of that same energy of like the desire to fork, the desire to create new assets, then got captured by Ethereum. Right. So like the Bitcoin fork phenomenon, like kind of was the same thing, a similar thing to like the Ethereum DeFi summer, like uh, for fork and fair launch phenomenon, like same kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would just summarize it down to uh, it became the place to issue tokens mm -hmm. and there's a lot of alpha to be gained if, you know, you can uh, if you can have you can be on the right side mm -hmm. of that. So I can't remember, I, I think this was true, but uh, in during the POV era days, I think you kind of thought that like Ethereum would just like go to zero. And if not you, then a, like a large percentage of the Bitcoiners that we had as guests would be like, yeah, all of you ETH heads, like, sorry, your blockchain is eventually going to not work and be gone in the future. Do you still believe that? Um, so I would say I've always had like a, I've always had an independent thought mm -hmm. in terms of like the crypto ecosystem, although very heavily influenced by uh, Bitcoin intellectuals. Mm -hmm. um, I never thought that like Ethereum was like heading straight to zero, but I did think that on a long enough time horizon, it's going to continue to depreciate against Bitcoin. Uh, still true right now, but at the same time, still way too early to see. Mm -hmm. um, personally, so, I, wait. So you you currently you still think that Ether will trend towards zero in Bitcoin terms over the long term. Well, I think that Ether is just like every other asset in the world, which all of them will trend towards zero in Bitcoin terms. Okay. So you're, yeah. you're, you are a hyper-Bitcoiner, hyper-Bitcoinization-er. I mean, yeah, we, we must move towards a world where we have a unified uh, settlement layer for value that's uncorruptible. I think Bitcoin is the best technology to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's many layers in which Bitcoin has enormous advantages in mm -hmm. Im impl implementing itself as that uh, as that settlement layer. So like for that to be true, therefore, all other assets that store value will trend to zero in Bitcoin terms. Like I 100% I still believe that. And so there's there's nothing about the 2021 bull market that made you question that idea. No, no. 
No, no, no. Even so, like even the so like we'll we'll say that like the twenty. I'm going to claim that Ethereum won the 2021 bull market. Do you agree with that? Like if, like if the, yeah, there was, there was a bull market, there was an event, Ethereum dominated it. And like categorically, like Solana didn't win, Avalanche didn't win, Bitcoin didn't win, Ethereum won. Um, so I've said this on POV crypto. Mm -hmm. I think like the whole crypto ecosystem is part of Bitcoin. Right. Yeah. So I think you remember that line. Yeah. So with that perspective, like Bitcoin had to gain from from the world mm -hmm. getting onboarded into the UX of leveraging crypto into understanding that there can be value um, that is on a, a public ledger and like the world is getting educated. We're at no matter what anyone says. OK, we're at less than one percent adoption. Mm -hmm. Right. Just world population. People who actually are using and understand Bitcoin and crypto, less than 1% adoption. So that means 99.9% .9 of the planet needs to go from like not understanding this stuff at all and being on the fiat mindset, and they have to transition all the way to Bitcoin. So like that is going to be a messy process. That is a long process. Uh, people will be making mental errors and mental miss and uh miss uh assessments mm -hmm. on the way to bitcoin in my opinion so like of course like they have to love nfts and all this other stuff that's like on the way to this very kind of extreme and different future that bitcoin like a hyper bitcoinized standard would have so i don't like okay in the short run could you have made a lot more money if you're in the crypto space versus bitcoin only definitely but in the long run, I don't know if that is actually an indication of like who won. Mm. I would say like the things that got the most mass appeal to the most fiat minded people are like, yeah, NFTs. That's the big, okay. The biggest number one winner is <laughs> NFTs because like that, everyone wants to do that. But like, guess what? What everyone wants to do right now, like in a world that's not a Bitcoin crypto world is not what everyone is going to want to do when the like the kind of like the games are changed. Everyone's playing on a different playing field. So I think we're still living in fiat land. So yeah, hey, you know, on the S curve of adoption, while we're over here at the bottom of the S, you know, there's going to be a lot of volatility. There's going to be a continued misallocation of capital. So I already, you know, I already gave my spiel. Like if you wanted to make the most amount of money in this past bull market, you should have listened to David, <laughs> but I, I don't think that that is like, uh, I don't think, I think it's way too early to say winners and losers. And I mean, Bitcoin advanced an enormous amount. So mm -hmm. I know. What do you, what do you think? I, 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 I feel like you've been asking me questions. Obviously they're interviewing me, but, uh, what do you think? Uh, how did you respond to that? So I think the, the bull market that happened, uh, as soon as the bull market started, like the the paradigm that we were used to, we as an Ethereans that were on crypto Twitter, the paradigm that we were used to was like, we fight with Bitcoiners. We definitely think we're right. Uh, when the bull market starts, people are going to people are going to resonate with Ethereum more than they will resonate with Bitcoin. Uh, and it went from like the, the as like in DeFi summer, like. DeFi summer, like the Ethereum app layer grew significantly, even though Ether price didn't. And then the Ether price started to respond aggressively at the end of DeFi summer into 2021. Like January 2021, it went from like $700 to like $1,500, broke through all time highs. At that moment in time, the collective Ethereum community that had stuck around during the bear market, I think mentally claimed victory. As in like, we, we, all of the arguments came through in Ethereum's favor in a big way. And also at the same time, like going in through 2022, no, 2021, like we as a community stopped caring about the Bitcoin maxis takes on Twitter. Like, remember the whole like supply gate, the ETH supply gate from Pierre Richard, like stuff like that. Like, oh, you don't know what the total supply of Ether is. And we were, we just like were face palming out that, except it was such a big deal because the Bitcoiners had dominated crypto Twitter for so long and, and did at that point. But we were like facepalming. It's like, this is a dumb argument that no one's going to care about in the future. And like, I do believe that that was the right take. Uh, and uh, other, uh, along with other things about like the, the takes that Bitcoiners had about Ethereum. As soon as mainstream adoption came around, like uh, 
I don't, I think the Bitcoiner like memes and narratives and like lessons just did not resonate with them as much. And so we stopped paying attention to like fighting with the Bitcoiners because we actually became like as an ecosystem, as a community concerned with Solana and Avalanche. And like, we actually learned that it wasn't Bitcoin that was gonna be the hard fight. It would be people forking Ethereum and spinning up this new Ethereum killers in the same way Bitcoin had Bitcoin killers in 2017. Like it was, turns out the actual, the bigger fights that we had to deal with were scale. Like, like our own problems, like Ethereum turns out it was our, it was our own issues that we needed to fight with, not like a public perception about Bitcoin versus Ethereum. So like the bigger fights that we had during 2021 were like uh, Solana, Avalanche, uh, Terra. Uh, and so like as a community, we kind of just like stopped thinking about Bitcoin because we don't, we didn't really consider it like a threat to the ecosystem. And again, this is coming from the perspective of people who think that there's going to be one dominant blockchain that will ultimately win, which I, both you and I think this probably is, is true. Uh, and so from the Ethereum perspective, like, yeah, Bitcoin is just like significantly less relevant than it once was. I mean, Bitcoin's chronically, chronically underappreciated, mm -hmm. chronically, chron chronically, uh, I guess like talked down to or uh you know bitcoin's the underdog mm -hmm. so uh that's that's a pretty comfortable position for me is betting on the underdog but bitcoin is the underdog is like a crazy thing to have said if you had said that like on pov crypto like uh, two years ago so i don't i don't think like bitcoin in terms of like its place in the ecosystem is the underdog i think it's 100 percent dominate across mm -hmm. what matters I think Bitcoin in the minds of the populace has, has almost always been, you know, written off and the underdog. Mm -hmm. Like mainstream media has been very happy to be like, Bitcoin's not going to happen, but DeFi is interesting. Blockchain is interesting. It's always been like this other thing right. is interesting. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, you can win this like little battle here, which is like convincing people that are so far away from what I think is like the future to like, like your thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that that actually matters for the future. So what do you, what do you, what's your take on uh, tornado cash and the fact that the biggest government in the world made something on Ethereum illegal. And I'll, and I'll echo Nick Carter's uh, uh, words from Nick Carter, where he said like, because of this, like, you know, that Ethereum is like over the target as in like, uh, it's on to something when a big nation state feels threatened by something like tornado cash and actually bans it. And so Nick Carter said like Ethereum is now like the spearhead of the cypherpunk movement. And like, and I see this in stark contrast to Bitcoin where like I, I call Bitcoin like impotent because it's just like not a threat. It's just like Bitcoin. It's just like it's got this this thing that has yeah, twenty one million. Off. Yeah, it's, it, it's written off. I love and it. So you you say you it love off. it, but I say like yeah, it's because like it's just it, you want to be a threat. You want to threaten the nation state, and if you uh, are, it's because you I are mean, super high. It is value. definitely threatening the nation state. That's why it is the thing that is being attacked most by the narrative. I mean, I don't think that it's mutually exclusive. I think that nation states want centralized control. Anything that gets made, like any sort of volume and traction that you know doesn't that that takes away from that like they're gonna attack so like i can view ethereum as like a if inefficient more censorship resistant no kyc exchange and then if you frame it that way then okay well there's been plenty of exchanges that have become illegal and attacked by the government that's still part of the bitcoin ecosystem like okay you came up with the ux that like got on their radar they attacked it like that's great that's like saying like this is now the spearhead of the cypherpunk movement. Like it's fucking ridiculous. Can you? You're, I think you'll have to explain to the listeners like why uh, something like Ethereum is inside of the Bitcoin ecosystem. Can you explain that perspective? Okay. Well, firstly, like Bitcoin is what started this ecosystem. Sure. Secondly, like Ethereum and all other chains like relied on Bitcoin to even get bootstrapped. Proof of work was the very first thing that can enable a decentralized currency. Everything else was either directly or indirectly built off of that existence. I don't think that that can be argued with. But beyond that, like 
all of these things are interoperable with each other. Like I see exchanges as layers on top of Bitcoin. I see the app layers, you know, whether they're centralized, decentralized, whatever, like whatever their server architecture, they're either directly or indirectly plugging into Bitcoin. And I just see Ethereum, like the best way I could describe Ethereum is like a, it's almost like this giant app layer for crypto that is much less efficient than a centralized one, aka you can call it a BNB or an FTX or Solana, but much more censorship resistant and much more permissionless. And it provided KYC free activity. Like those are the things that it solved for. Um, there's a lot of ways where it like is obviously independent and it's done its own thing since it's bootstrapped off Bitcoin, but I don't see it as being outside of like this layering mm -hmm. of like the crypto enabled ecosystem. And at the heart of that, the only thing that like is not fully manipulated by fiat, even though it is still slightly manipulated by fiat is the, is the price of terror, like the, the, the energy conversion into Bitcoin ratio. Like that, it, to me, like that is like, that is like the root of all of this stuff. So I, that's definitely still true in my opinion. Okay. So your, your perspective is like, uh, there's, um, you have Bitcoin as, as the base layer. You have Ethereum as a layer on top of that. You have Bitcoin proof of work as the thing that grounds Bitcoin into the real world. That's outside of fiat systems. Then you have Bitcoin, then you have Ethereum, then you have the Ethereum app layer. Uh, and all the other... And then all, all the all, other variations like, and then too. We, you go up the stack and you get into the shit coins as you go further up the stack. I mean, up sideways around, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe instead of like a root or layers, maybe it's like, uh, it's like a solar system, you know, mm. with like just stuff orbiting around it. But, uh, I mean, I don't know. That's uh, it's, it's definitely my perspective. I think it's a unique perspective. I don't, I don't think that most Bitcoiners think mm. that way. And you know, to the Ethereans or ETH heads who'd be like, what a crazy fuck. Like, ETH heads have been writing off Bitcoin and have had, in my opinion, incorrect uh, worldview and, and perspectives on how Bitcoin is, is changing the world. So, of course, you're not going to get it. How is Bitcoin changing the world? Uh, it's changing the world in terms of it's creating that settlement layer. Mm -hmm. It is creating a monetary... Uh, it, it's creating a monetary ecosystem where you can count like this divided by 21 million like mm -hmm. it's that is like that's the ultimate goal is being able to count and price things mm -hmm. right this, is, this is the meme of infinity over bitcoin infinity over 21 million. just yeah the human world divided by it's like everything a system where you can count every, just, everything divided by 21 yeah million. It, it is literally it's as simple as a system that you can count that is it we live right now in a system where we're trying to mm -hmm. allocate capital where no one can effing count um and then and then on top of that and this might be even bigger than the sound money revolution aka a system where you can actually count is Bitcoin's place in the energy infrastructure. Like mm -hmm. we're seeing how wrecked our energy infrastructure is in the world, how inefficient it is, how corrupt it is, uh, how political forces uh, are attacking it, how uh, just narratives, the whole thing is just, it doesn't work. And, and Bitcoin is like it grounds the world in energy, the, the monetary system in energy. It also does an amazing thing to the energy system, which is it becomes the the buyer of first resort and the buyer of last resort, and it is geographically independent. You can plug it in, you know, connect mm. to the network from anywhere, and that's just never existed before. The closest thing that almost existed like that is being able to smelt aluminum, uh, but even still, like that's like you can't do that on the level of hey, I'm just gonna cap this one methane flare in this random field and mine Bitcoin. Like you, it, that requires an enormous amount of unexportable energy uh, in a very specific place. So like Bitcoin is a thousand. If you think of like Bitcoin proof of work as an improvement on being able to export energy via aluminum smelting, like it's a million x improvement. You can set it up anywhere, and you can ship the, you can mm -hmm. export the energy with Bitcoin to a, a liquid market anywhere with no physical constraints. So, I mean, between like revolutionary our energy grid, which is something that we need to do, it is huge. And between creating a monetary system that's uncorruptible, you can count, like that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what world you guys are living in, but that is, those are two massive problems in the world right now. 
Yeah, I, I mean, Bankless listeners will know that I kind of think ba- ba- almost every single Bitcoin or over index is on like how strong the relationship between Bitcoin and energy is. I don't know if you want to go into that or not. Do you want to go into that? I mean, look around. Like energy producers, big and small, are getting into it. So I right, but it's, it's like bi- Bitcoin and proof of work is a boon to energy producers at the cost of Bitcoin. And so like Why? all all of the, because Bitcoin, when you produce energy, you are able to mine Bitcoin and then sell Bitcoins to pay for the cost of producing that energy. So energy production gets cheaper. And then also Bitcoin, that, and that the reason why it gets cheaper is because you can sell Bitcoins to subsidize it. And so it pulls away the value of Bitcoin and then it adds value to the energy grid. So the yeah, energy Bitcoin's grid- good for the world, man. It's not about the Cantillon effect. Oh, sorry? It's not about insiders being able to hold onto their coins. It's not about maximizing value for- right. Whatever Bitcoin's about making the world a better place, making but at energy the cost of itself. No, I disagree. A value comes out of Bitcoin so, to pay for energy that, and the energy that's grid. That's just not true. That's a hundred percent true. That's what you miners mine the Bitcoin. They consume energy to do that. They receive the Bitcoins and then they sell the Bitcoins to pay for their business. Value leaves Bitcoin and it goes into the energy energy grid, the energy infrastructure. So Bitcoin is a mechanism to bootstrap out better energy infrastructure. I don't think at that the that's, cost of itself. No, I think that that's just a healthy ecosystem. Like, yes, there is selling that has to happen of Bitcoin. Like, there has to be a bigger there has to be a bigger market of buyers. Like, that is part of like. Let, let's just zoom out really mm-hmm. quick. Bitcoin is binary, in my opinion. Yeah. Which means that the incentives work, or the incentives don't work. Mm-hmm. So. If Bitcoin's incentives are flawed, a.k.a. miners are going to leech onto it and then bury the system, yep. which is what you're saying. Yep. OK, the incentives don't work. Mm-hmm. OK, but I don't think that that's the case. I think the incentives work. And if the incentives work, then miners will Bitcoin will help energy infrastructure bootstrap and improve across the planet. Mm-hmm. Bitcoin is going to become literally at the center of all energy infrastructure across the planet. Bitcoin buyers are going to increase as they see Bitcoin becoming a greater and greater part of the real world that is 100% needed Mm -hmm. to make any of this stuff that we're enjoying and leveraging in the modern world possible. And it's going, and it's going to increase in buyers. We're at less than 1% adoption right now. Mm -hmm. There's only 21 million Bitcoin. Like, if you actually think through what adoption looks like, I'm not concerned. The miners can sell the Bitcoin. Actually, we need that. That's called healthy distribution of coins. That's how you actually create a monetary system that's fair. There's a reason why the world converged around uh, you know, metals. It's because metals are everywhere on the planet. They're distributed. They're not just in one spot. So I think that the distribution of coins is, is actually a healthy part of right. Bitcoin's incentive structure. Like You need that. Yes. Yeah. It's it's good for it's good for distribution. The equal and opposite net effect of that is that it actually creates centralization and security. But we'll we'll go down that path uh, later. I, look, Dave, I I just think that you, the way that you're analyzing these systems are just wrong. I know. So, I know. Like, you it's think just your your you assess- <laughs> your your you're, you're like, hey, that's going to create centralization here. Like. I don't think that you fully understand the Bitcoin system. In all of my years in crypto, I've never been hacked, scammed, or lost money to a thief. And a lot of that credit goes to my Ledger hardware wallet. The Ledger Nano X and the Ledger Nano S Plus hardware wallets allow users like you and me to secure and manage all of our crypto assets and our NFTs, all with the security of storing users' private keys offline and out of reach from hackers. The Ledger Nano X is the perfect hardware wallet for managing your crypto and NFTs on the go because it connects to your phone with Bluetooth and has a nice big screen for easy transaction readings. Ledger has also upgraded the iconic Ledger Nano S and made the new Ledger Nano S device more DeFi and NFT friendly, making it the perfect hardware wallet for beginners. Ledger has truly maximized for both ease of use and security. So discover which Ledger device is best suited for your journey by going and visiting shop.ledger.com. 
The Layer 2 era is upon us. Ethereum's Layer 2 ecosystem is growing every day, and we need Layer 2 bridges to be fast and efficient in order to live a Layer 2 life. Across is the fastest, cheapest, and most secure cross-chain bridge. With Across, you don't have to worry about high fees or long wait times. Assets are bridged and available for use almost instantaneously. Across's bridges are powered by UMA's optimistic oracle to securely transfer tokens between Layer 2s and Ethereum. Across's critical ecosystem infrastructure and Across V2 has just launched. Their new version focuses on higher capital efficiency, layer 2 to layer 2 transfers, and a brand new chain with Polygon, all while prioritizing high security and low fees. You can be a part of Across's story by joining their Discord and using Across for all of your layer 2 transferring needs. So go to Across.to to quickly and securely bridge your assets between Ethereum, Optimism, Polygon, Arbitrum, or Boba networks. The Brave Wallet is your secure multi-chain on-ramp into Web3 and is built directly into the Brave privacy browser. Gone are the days of managing multiple wallet extensions that put you at risk of phishing, spoofs, and tracking. With the Brave Wallet, you can securely manage your crypto assets across more than 100 different chains, including Ethereum, Layer 2s, Solana, and more, all without downloading risky extensions. The Brave Wallet is easy to set up and removes the headache of jumping between wallets and extensions. It's lightweight, but packed with great features like built-in token swaps, buying and holding NFTs with a gallery view, and support for hardware wallets. But also much more than that, because Brave is shipping new features every single month with a mission to make Web3 easier to navigate for its over 55 million users. Wallet extensions are a thing of the past. So get started with Brave's Web3 Ready browser today and experience a decentralized web seamlessly without all the clutter. You can download the browser at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. We're watching miners right now, the Argo or whatever, like go through uh, at be the beginnings of like being able to like not make ends meet and go through consolidation as the inefficient miners get washed out by the efficient miners and like, yay, like miners are becoming more efficient through the bear market as the inefficient ones like burn out. But that's just centralization of security. But that's also not the point I want to make. Okay, wait, what? no, hold on. So the largest miners in the world, mm -hmm. the ones that have been centralizing ASICs, mm -hmm. they're all going under and they're selling their ASICs for pennies on the dollar to whoever is willing to buy them. So that's a distribution effect. That's actually, that is the destruction of centralization. Hey, you people only, you either get the distribution and decentralization of BTC, the asset, or you get the decentralization of Bitcoin security. You don't get both. Those are I, I, I disagree opposites. with that because your, your assumption is that Bitcoin mining, there's only benefic benefits to, uh, to in, in scale. So like the benefits in having large scale, mm -hmm. the economies of scale, that's the phrase. Mm -hmm. You you only think that Bitcoin mining equals economies of scale, period. Correct. I yes. think like Bitcoin mining is a very complex ecosystem mm -hmm. that economies of scale are not the only element to that. And that there's actually in many use cases, there's a diseconomy of scale. Like if you want to use Bitcoin miners and, and collect their waste heat, there's a diseconomy of scale to that because you can only use so much heat in one place. And then all of a sudden heat becomes an issue. Then you have to spend energy and resources to get rid of that heat. So if you want to use Bitcoin mining heat to power a greenhouse, well, like there's an efficient size of a greenhouse and there's a standard, you know, market delivered uh scale that makes sense and then all like bitcoin mining is an energy efficiency catalyst so anywhere where you need energy efficiency bitcoin mining is going to help there so there's actually a dis economy of scale because not everyone is located in the same place not everyone yeah. needs that efficiency in the same place so i disagree completely with your assessment of i think that's such how a the mining works and order consequence like it doesn't upset the rule like it's perhaps it slows it down, but it still doesn't break the rule that one dollar of capital produces certain amount of hash, like X number of hashes. And then ten dollars of capital produces more than ten dollars of cap of, of hashes. So the, like, the thing that breaks that rule is that energy in specific quantity is not located in the central place. People needing or could benefits from the energy efficiencies are not located in one place. So unless you think the whole world is converging on a geography, like that's the beautiful thing about Bitcoin mining. It's it's geographically independent. It hits right, the, it just hits the geography entity, entity independent. Okay, well, you know, I've yet to see an entity take over. So sure. there is literally zero history of sure. the game theory not working. Uh, okay, but I want to go back to the point that I, I wanted to make in the first place before we go down. We went down like the energy <laughs> thing. Yeah. The, this and go, this goes back to um, Bitcoin miners uh, mine Bitcoin, 
cost them energy, sell their bitcoins to pay for the costs. And that I'm, I'm saying that that is a transfer of value from Bitcoin to the energy grid. I think what you're saying is that people who will, will they'll see Bitcoin being integrated into the energy grid across the world. Bitcoin will be like baked into the energy system so well that people will just notice that and it'll be beneficial to Bitcoin. It's not after they're noticing the it like it, it will be continue to get priced in. Like, so, Bitcoin like, will be important. It's not a bullish thing to be integrated into the energy grid. That's the point I want to make. Is that like I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything more bullish than that. No, because it's this one. It's this it's one way transfer of value from Bitcoin into the energy system. And if Bitcoin continues to like go up in market cap, then the energy system can get better. But it's always a one way street. And so the only way that value goes back into Bitcoin is if people like just appreciate that fact. And but it's not a codified mechanism. So there's this codified mechanism of Bitcoin gets sold to pay for energy. And there is no e equal and opposite codified mechanism where value goes back into Bitcoin other than just like the valence of like positive perception of it being around the energy grid. When people research it and they see that Bitcoin only gets sold to pay for energy, that's not like the perception that you want. That's bearish. And so people aren't going to appreciate Bitcoin more because they don't want to be the bag holders because all the miners are able to dump their Bitcoins to pay for their energy. Like it's not a good association. It's a, it's a negative association. I think that if you're trying to sell an investment scheme to people, then maybe that you can make that argument. If you're trying to make the world a better place, if you're trying to create an economic system that integrates into the planet and helps humans economically coordinate and manage their energy, then it's going to be okay. But, but <laughs> like, Bitcoin... I don't know Bit how else to tell you. But Bitcoin doesn't work if it doesn't go up in price. Like, it has to go up in price. Look, <laughs> Bitcoin's incentive work or they don't. If the incentives work, I think it's going to be the most competitive money on the planet and it will continue to outcompete and it will reach hyper-Bitcoinization. If the incentives don't work, it's going to zero. I hope you got some guns and bullion because <laughs> we got some big-ass problems in front of us. Um, maybe Ethereum can escape that. Uh, that dichotomy, I, I just, I don't know. Like, whenever you're like, hey, guess what? Like, the miners, it doesn't work. Pretty much what you're saying is, I don't think the incentives are going to work into the future. And my response to that would be, well, if you pay attention to what's going on, obviously that dynamic is, that you're describing is not the actual dynamic. Secondly, there is continuing to be increased people who have faith, have comfort, want to continue to hold and accumulate this asset greater than the miners being able to sell. And then on top of that, if that stops, then Bitcoin will break. So, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you should diversify. Like, I've always been a proponent to like, hey, if you're actually bullish enough on Bitcoin, you never have to fully leverage yourself against Bitcoin. Like, you can be comfortable in your life. You can hold other assets because one Bitcoin is going to be worth an insane amount of money. The whole point is you need to get Bitcoin from the beginning of the S curve to the other side. <laughs> any amount, literally any amount that you can buy on this side, if we reach hyper Bitcoinization, will be more, will be an insane amount of money on the other end because it's a fixed supply currency that's also technology. So if we go from less than 1% adoption to 99% adoption, and then on top of that, Bitcoin's a better system, theoretically, because you can count and it helps with the energy grid. So theoretically, it will help us create more value mm -hmm. than any amount that you own right now. The getting it to the other side is going to make you insanely wealthy. Um, so you can like you don't have to be over indexed against Bitcoin. You don't have to put yourself in a position where if the economic assumptions don't work, if the game theory doesn't work, that you're wrecked. Like, that's bad personal finance, in my opinion. So, I mean, like, hey, if you, if you, you could argue with me that Bitcoin's incentives don't work, so you're blue in the face. I will just keep telling you that the history doesn't show that. All the trends moving forward doesn't show that. And I don't think that Ethereum, like, onboarding people onto public key cryptography and, and signing with your, with your private keys and putting value in internet protocols. I don't actually think that that takes away from Bitcoin. Like, I, I just think we need to onboard 99% of people 
Like, there's not one way to onboard them all because they all have different base assumptions on how the world works. So actually, it's a benefit to Bitcoin that someone can be like, hey, I'm going to take a system similar to Bitcoin. I'm going to change the dynamics a little bit to make it fit my worldview a little bit. And, and maybe that will attract more people to the space. Like most people are not aligned to the future view of where Bitcoin's taking us, mm-hmm. obviously, because Bitcoin is a paradigm shift. If mm-hmm. everyone was aligned with it, then it like it wouldn't be that big of a deal because everyone was mentally able to deal with that. But guess what? Before we had electricity, only Nikola Tesla saw the future, mm. <laughs> right? Like you ask the average person, hey, is electricity going to be a big deal? Like, what's that? <laughs> but once it became a thing, they couldn't lay down the fiber fast enough. Mm-hmm. They couldn't lay down the lines fast enough because it was a game changer. It's undeniable. So I just think that's what Bitcoin is. Does Bitcoin work if it's not the number one most valued crypto asset? Definitely. Yeah. yeah and if anything, like that's coming 100%. Something is going to flip Bitcoin? Well, I mean, Bitcoin's already not the biggest currency in the world. So mm-hmm. like... Does it matter if that there's a bigger currency that is a cryptographic one? Like, I could definitely see, like, a stable coin flipping Bitcoin soon. Mm-hmm. Like, does that mean because, like, they're partially, like, settled on Ethereum that Ethereum is flipping Bitcoin? Like, I don't necessarily know. Like, I think, like, every single sacred cow, that's why the framing of, like, market cap, mm-hmm. it's like... Like that, yeah. Bitcoiners have always hated the market, the market cap. Yeah, measure. I mean, but regardless, like every sacred cow is going to be broken on the way to hyper Bitcoinization, in my opinion. Wait, so if we are in hyper Bitcoinization, is Bitcoin the largest money market by by market? Yeah, cap? and the end result, the end result, but like on the way there, doesn't yeah, going from zero, you know, less than one percent adoption to ninety nine, you know, to one hundred percent adoption. There's just a lot of confusion. Mm-hmm. Like, there's going to be a lot of experimentation. Do you remember? H- the HD DVD versus Blu-ray debacle, right. Right. and then guess what actually got ma- mainstream adoption? It's Netflix. Digital. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Streaming. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, the consumer was wrong the whole time. <laughs> they were wrong the whole time. So, like, hey, you know, did, did video, did streaming, mm-hmm. you know, did it matter to streaming that DVD, HD DVD, and Blu-ray are all bigger at one point? Mm-hmm. Didn't matter at all. I think the, the biggest difference between you and I, Ethereans and Bitcoiners, is like we all agree like there's a paradigm shift that's coming, but we just don't agree on what that paradigm shift actually is. Yeah, right? I agree with that. <laughs> and so like my big paradigm shift is that we can take human systems that we have already created throughout history, that we've been recreating throughout history, and make them better. Uh, and that the better form factor is like a much, much, much better, but it's still the same thing that we've already had. So like the Dutch East India Company in 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 the Netherlands, and then and then the Delaware LLC in the United States now DAOs on Ethereum, and so like one of the reasons one of the thing, reasons why I have like such conviction in Ethereum is like we see these principles and these structures that humans have been doing for generations, for centuries, and now we're seeing them again on Ethereum, but with more and more just like codified cryptography, shared truth, like objective nature to them, and so like that gives me. Uh, confidence and that like okay we've already been doing these things and now Ethereum allows us to do these things better since we were doing them once before now we have a better way to do it that's bullish for Ethereum once people can wrap their heads around it and so we are taking these like systems that we've already created in the world stock exchanges uh, like like securitization like assets non-fungible assets like a mortgage non-fungible tokens like a crypto punk we've already been doing all of these things and now ethereum does it better and it does it in a more trustless way that is more like more liquidity more user participation more freedom more sovereignty interoperability. and more interoperability yes and so like same same but better and that's a paradigm shift the bitcoin or par- paradigm shift the paradigm shift that i hear you make is something that is to me it's like way bigger of a paradigm shift. It's way more massive of like a proposed what it what it actually means. And I'm not going to do it justice if I try and do it, but maybe you can like articulate what your paradigm shift is. Yeah, I I think that was great framing actually. So, mm-hmm. you know, that the the longest monologue that I agreed with that you've said so far. <laughs> and and uh and if anything like I agree with you that like a lot like crypto in general is effectively codifying ancient wisdom to some degree 100 percent. so what i would say is like sure all of the but everything you described to me in terms of like 
how the layers of society, like we're talking about the layers of a blockchain, the layers of money, all this stuff. Yep. Like society is built on layers, right? Mm -hmm. So like everything you described to me is like the app layer of society. Right. Like yeah. the revolution is going to happen at the foundation. And the that's why the money. foundations, the foundation in Bitcoin is too also codified in ancient, mm -hmm. <laughs> in ancient wisdom and technology and Lindy, which is like, you know, looking at the foundation of the monetary system. It's like, okay, in the past, there's a lot of arguments on like the history of it. Uh, Nick Zabo has a great article, uh, shelling out, which kind of talks about, you know, this evolution, but ultimately, you know, the world, we converged around, uh, you know, gold and silver around precious metals. Bitcoin is codified in the mechanism, similar mechanisms, like inherently mm -hmm. similar mechanisms, but code and dematerialized and a 10 hundred X improvement on mm -hmm. those same mechanism at the very base. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I think if anything, Ethereum is like more like this sandbox, but in the long enough time horizon, like the actual evolution happens off the base and it's built off of the base of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think that we're, we're seeing a similar trend. I'm just focusing on the foundation and I, right. I think Bitcoin's attacking that foundation right. very, very effectively. Yeah. And I think my like, uh, my response to that would be like, well, Ether as a money is also going after that same foundation. And also if we take away, if we take like Bitcoin is gold and gold has been around forever, I think that's over indexing on like how big of a deal gold is. Cause like, yeah, gold's been, gold transcends like empires. It transcends organizational structures, but like it doesn't actually like one of the, one of the reasons why empires are created is because they were able to make gold do things like coinage, right? Like we were able to make fiat gold, fiat issuance of gold. And like that created temporary boons. Then it created a bust. Uh, but like we, gold's been, imperfect. I know. Yeah. We've been, we've been <laughs> like creating other monetary systems around gold, sometimes completely unrelated to gold that created their own in innovations as well. And it's so like one of the bull cases for Ethereum is that like, you can express any monetary policy on Ethereum that you want uh, with, you know, tokens. Issue, issue a token and make that token do a thing. Uh, and if that thing is liked by the populace, then it sticks around. Uh, and so any sort of just like monetary policy that we enjoy as humans, as money enjoyers, like we can have that express on Ethereum. So, like, I, I, I don't think that money enjoyers enjoy monetary policy. I think like do do you have a specific like preference of kilowatts or hertz or whatever frequency that is used in order to like make all this tech happen around us? No, I don't. Like you use what works, uh -huh. use what has been built into the system, like that perpetuates itself. Like I don't think people are gonna choose a money. I mm -hmm. think money is literally shoved down people's throats because you either adopt it or you get fucked <laughs> it's a massive efficiency gain or it's uh -huh. fucking poverty mm -hmm. like it's i'm not gonna be a money enjoyer who's like you know i kind of enjoy this flavor of money it's like no it's like you're holding pesos and getting fucked or you're getting into dollars in the most efficient way possible mm -hmm. like that is the paradigm right so like you don't do you you don't give any sort of like uh credit to the argument that like if Ethereum recreates the global financial system, it's more likely going to be Ether, the currency, than Bitcoin, the currency that flows through that financial system? I mean, like, if you see something that's fucking crumbling and looks like shit, like, why would you want to recreate it? Like, I'm trying to, like... Because the form factor that you recreate it in is not crumbling. It's actually the thing that replaces it. So, like, hey, like, is your stock exchange bad? Because, uh, like, we still need stock exchanges. We'll just use Uniswap instead of the one that's breaking. Yeah. No, so, I mean, uh, do you remember that famous uh, Henry Ford uh, quote? Um, something about horses and cars. It's like, if I would have asked the people, right. if they, you know, what they wanted, they would have said, I want a faster horse. Right. Yeah, like, everyone, everyone likes to leverage that quote, but like I can say that you can, you can always, it's like unfalsifiable, right? It's just like, yeah, you can, that's a fun quote, and you can kind of make that about anything. Like pick, pick any sort of thing that you believe in, and you can apply that to like the Henry Ford quote. I mean, I guess that's fair, but I, I was just trying to illustrate my perspective here. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, it's nice sure. that you're trying to recreate the current financial app layer on Ethereum, and maybe Ethereum doesn't have some of the corruptions that the current mm -hmm. financial app layer has. But 
I think that remains to be seen. We haven't seen the game get lucrative enough and the game get big enough and enough big players uh, mm -hmm. fighting in that game. But I'm saying is like, wow, that is misallocation of capital on misallocation of capital on misallocation of capital on misallocation mm -hmm. of capital. Like the whole thing, we need to burn the whole thing down. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin is it just a new foundation right. built in first principles. And I think that we're going to build a new system based on that. Because if you don't, like, I think it's like a, a, a capitalism, communism paradigm in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. It's like, at one point, the president of Russia visited America, the average grocery store, and it was like, wow, the average American has more than the richest Russian ever could imagine. Because the system just mm -hmm. created much, much more wealth and optionality. And I, I, I really do think, like, zoom forward six or seven years, mm -hmm. like, we'll be looking at the traditional system, and we'll be looking at the Bitcoin ecosystem... I don't know if you want to include crypto or not in that. It depends on who your opinion is. I think the, the crypto system is like a bridge almost. Mm -hmm. But like it's going to be the dichotomy is going to be the same. It's poverty. It's like poverty and, and destitution or Bitcoin and energy and wealth. Mm -hmm. Like that's the paradigm. No one's going to choose poverty. Yeah. You, you said like uh, uh, one system is like is poverty. The other system is like wealth and optionality. I think one main like core philosophical difference between Bitcoiners and Ethereans is like Bitcoin is like, all right, no more seniorage, no more issuance, no more cancel on effect, just Bitcoin. It's the best. So much more simple, so much more efficient. One shelling point. You can count. Yeah, you can count. You can count to 21 million. Bless uh, up. <laughs> Ethereum is like uh, everyone gets issuance. Everyone gets the cancel on effect. We all get to print money now. Like, and so when everyone can print money, no one can really print money because since the power to issue is now in the hands of the most marginal user, then it's actually a check on the bigger issuers of the world. It's like we all get to create tokens. We all get to mint NFTs. We all get to do it. No longer is the power of asset issuance constrained behind the doors of Wall Street and behind nation state like threats of violence. Now the individual can make their token and do their weird yield farming thing. Uh, and I think that is wealth and optionality for as many people as possible i mean the current world that bitcoin has created for us is a world where there's bitcoin and it's also a world where the blueprint for blockchain technology allowed everyone to mint stuff and guess what that actually drowns out i think it actually drowns out fiat more than it actually drowns out bitcoin yeah, so i, I think what we see is like there's going to be bitcoin Maybe you say they'll be ether and there will be everything else and it'll actually be individuals drowning out like mm -hmm. governments who had a monopoly on money printing. Maybe right. it's governments and corporations. Right. Right. But like I that, think that's part of the revolution is those things have yeah. to be drowned out. And I've I've said this on POV crypto. I've said this on the Internet. Like shit coins are good for Bitcoin mm -hmm. because there's two things happening. There's Bitcoin and then there's a hydra of shit. And both things are attacking the state together. The right. real revolution is individuals and sovereignty versus centralization and statism. So if you see that as the paradigm, all of these things are technologies to empower individual and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. That's why we're mostly on the same team, mm -hmm. even though we disagree on you know, the how, that, yeah. how the sovereignty tech is going to play out. I think if, you, if you're saying like it's shit coins and issuance that drowns out the nation state, the nation state is the incumbent. Right. So whoever gets to dethrone the incumbent is the new Chad. And so if like if Bitcoin's not doing that, and this goes back to like the Nick Carter quote where he's like, oh, yeah, the things that are going on on the Ethereum app layer are the there. new like spearhead of the cypherpunk movement. It's because like if, if we are the ones who because we have the issuance that we are now drowning out old nation state issuance, that makes us the Chad's. And if Bitcoin's not doing it, then Bitcoin's not the chat. See, this is like, I love that framing. Great, <laughs> great rhetoric. Excellent rhetoric. <laughs> Fantastic, David. Um, look, that's fine. Personally, I think that like what the shitcoins do is they DDoS regulators. Yeah. So it's not like the shitcoins are disrupting regulators. I think mm -hmm. Bitcoin, Bitcoin is actually what's disrupting the incumbents because Bitcoin's creating sound money for the people that doesn't have the Cantillon effect. Yeah. Bitcoin is helping fix the energy infrastructure in a decentralized way. But what the Hydra of shit does is it DDoSes the regulators and it acts as a shield for Bitcoin. So that would be my framing, but I like your rhetoric. <laughs> All right. I don't have any other uh, topics in my head. Uh, you have anything else you want to talk about? Um, no, man. Uh, beautiful apartment. Great studio. 
I need to get yeah. some Shure mics on my own. <laughs> I need I need to upgrade my studio for sure. Yeah, yeah. I see you with your, your <laughs> you still have that Yeti Nano microphone. Yeah, we got to get your microphone. Yeah, you know, we we got like a little studio in the Bitcoin Magazine uh, mm-hmm. office, but we like distributed the the equipment to the people who are on camera all the time. So nice. I just like don't podcast as much as you anymore. Yeah, um, you're, you're a big uh, big operator now. <laughs> you know. I miss the days of uh, the, <laughs> the simple production. days. Yeah, I miss the simple days. Don't get don't get too big, but uh, <laughs> y'all, I mean, uh, shit is just getting interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think uh, Twitter and uh, regulation mm-hmm. and Bitcoin and crypto, all of these things are going to continue to become more important. And like, frankly. Mm-hmm. They're already kind of part of like the political conversation. Right. I think the next presidential election is going to be a key topic. Sure. And yeah. to everyone out there who's saying like, oh, crypto is going to be adopted over the course of like 50 years, not in my lifetime. Right. You're all fucking bears. Right. Like yeah. none of you are aligned with how fast this shit is right. going to go. So if I could give anyone on the bankless side of things a pep talk, it's like this technology, it either improves the world it's either undeniable mm-hmm. it's going to if, if those are the, if that's true then it's going to take hold incredibly mm-hmm. fast mm-hmm. like i really don't think that this stuff is going to take our lifetimes right no not at all I, I definitely agree with that and i think like we're starting to see it accelerate like that that's the main difference between i think the, uh, this current bear market versus the last one is like the rate of development is like 10 times faster than it was. And it's going to keep compounding. It's only, yeah. And I, I do feel like we are at the part of the S curve where you can actually see the slope starting to increase. I think we're done with the S curve by the end of this decade. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be, that's going to be wild. I agree yeah. with that. I think, I think 2030, like that's going to be a, a key marker. Mm-hmm. Um, see where the hell we're at. But yeah. Boy, mm-hmm. if, if we're going from the flat part to the, Mm-hmm. <laughs> to the up part of the S, mm-hmm. more volatility. Right. Yeah. That doesn't <laughs> Not mean less. That doesn't mean that's what prices do. That just means what adoption does. Prices can go up and down, left and right throughout that. Oh yeah. Well, I think it, prices will go up, but it's it's gonna like right effectively gonna, go up and down against that. Yeah. But when it's going like this, right. that's gonna be a massive volatility to the upside. Like, yeah, it's just gonna get wild, man. It's just going to get wild. Yeah, 100%. Well, CK, it's been a a thrill being on the ride with you thus far, and it's going to be a thrill taking the rest of the decade by the horns. All right, let's eat some food. Let's do it. Sorry to all the uh, bankless listeners that won't be able to enjoy my smoked salmon, but it's very delicious. Peace. Sucks to suck. Peace. Peace. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.